The 27th of March 1986 was just a regular day in the heart of Melbourne. But just after 1pm, that normality was shattered when a car bomb exploded outside the city's police headquarters. It was an attack that changed a city. There was just an absolute feeling of total disbelief that this could happen in Melbourne. There was even a feeling amongst the criminal fraternity that it was a step too far. A car bomb that struck at the very heart of Victoria. This was more like a scene from Beirut than lunchtime Melbourne. I thought the roof was going to come in, so I belled it out. It would take diligent detective work and forensic science to bring the bombers to justice. We were able to piece together bit by bit uh, what was in the vehicle at the time it was detonated outside Russell Street. The Russell Street bombing was a crime that shook Australia. Approaching lunchtime on the 27th of March, 1986. Office workers, court officials and police were going about their business, sitting at their desks, attending meetings or planning what they would have for their lunch. But in one instant, hundreds of lives were changed forever. At the third stroke, it will be 12, 59 and 50 seconds. Vicar Street, Russell Street, 150, you receive that? Yes, Russell 150, there's no further personnel required. I will, for the time being, uh, leave a static presence here uh, until we see what develops, over. Roger that, and Vicar City, Russell Street, 130, um, negative, no further um, police required at the scene. The 150 will leave um, some members static in St Kilda Road. Received. 30 copy. That particular day I didn't have a busy morning, so I actually went up to the Australian Taxation Office to pick up some forms as it was tax time for all of the staff in my office. And uh, on returning, I had an appointment at one o'clock with a client, and uh, I was aware that I was right on that time. It was very busy police-wise, very busy court-wise, just a, a normal day. I was allocated to the civil court that day, a former colleague of mine was to pick me up approximately at one o'clock, so I was on the western side of Russell Street, on the court side, with the police headquarters directly in front of me. I turned left into Russell Street from La Trobe Street, looked for a parking spot and saw one right at the front of uh, Russell Street uh, and did notice a brown Commodore sedan parked there. Also on Russell Street that lunchtime was a young police officer serving at the city watch house opposite the Russell Street headquarters. Her name was Angela Taylor and she had just volunteered to collect lunch. I watched Angela Taylor leave the building. She left from the main entrance on the Russell Street side of the magistrate's court, came down the steps, uh, started to cross the road, as I got around the corner, I became aware that it was actually very quiet and I was just about to run across the road so I could make my one o'clock appointment when I noticed a car coming from my right through the intersection of the Trobe Street. And I thought, no, I'll let this car go. And as he got adjacent to me, I looked back at the Commodore and up it went. Russell 750. Russell 750. 750, I presume you heard that loud explosion right next to you. Russell 750, it um, totally shattered our windows. Roger that, Russell Street 306. All units approach with caution just in case there's a second. There is two on four, and kill the road just approaching the city. What's going on? Uh, We're having loud explosions. Uh, We've had a car bomb in Russell Street outside the police station. North. Unbeknownst to the witnesses that day, the Holden Commodore parked outside the Russell Street Police Headquarters contained almost 60 sticks of explosive, packed into the boot, centre console and glove box of the car. 
It blew me about six or seven or eight metres back into the bluestone wall of the magistrate's court. The car completely disintegrated and there was metal flying everywhere. All of a sudden then I was aware that my uh, left thigh had been struck by something. My second thought was that this is a bomb. Yeah, that car's still on fire. Can we have the fire brigade here, please? Roger, right, stand by. I looked behind and saw this big black plume of smoke and saw that it was in the vicinity of, of Russell Street. People are coming out, walking towards to see where that explosion is coming from. Right back. A sea of confusion. Uh, and as you may see in some footages, the, the people are coming out, the minor explosions are now to occur. There's been a second explosion unit, stay away from the area. What were, I believe, to be petrol tanks and the likes. But even as a trained investigator, you know, I didn't turn my mind to a terrorist act. I'm sure there was a, a shock component that kicked in because although I had a, a clearly a, a, a serious injury to my leg. I wasn't even aware of the pain. There was a great deal of panic. Um, I remember some of the uh, one particular policeman who appeared to have just lost control. He was screaming at people and quite frankly he wasn't doing any good. The police decided that we were in an unsafe situation because there were still some explosions going on. So I was told, take your ambulance and the people you've got on board and move further back. The communications section was on the first floor, uh, which is only just slightly above the level of, of the street. And uh, fortunately, that particular building, that particular office had very heavy curtains on it. And uh, a lot of the shrapnel and the glass, of course, that, that blew inwards when the, when the car bomb detonated, uh, it was caught by the heavy, uh, the heavy curtains in the communication centre. Otherwise, of course, there could have been people in that part of the building that uh, could have suffered very serious facial injuries, of course, from flying debris and glass. Across Russell Street, the magistrate's court had also been damaged by the explosion. Lawyer Bernie Barmer was in his office when the bomb detonated, and in the chaos, he realised he needed to get out. I thought the roof was going to come in, so I bailed it out and straight down the steps into Russell Street where I ran into poor old Angela. And um, uh, what drew me to her attention is that like she was, her boot laces were on fire. Um, her clothing had been um, predominantly blown off. Angela Taylor had been caught by the full force of the blast and had suffered horrific injuries. She was the bravest girl of all get out, and uh, um, she was um, uttering things like the bastards and shit like that. She must have been in huge pain. 7507, we have people with injuries. We require an ambulance, please. I was working retail and mm. I had, it was just a small toy shop and I had the radio on and they said there's been a bombing and there's been a woman that's hurt. And my first instinct and thought was, it's not my Angie, they're talking about a woman and I've got a little girl. Angela and the other wounded, including fellow officer Constable Carl Donadio and Ian West were rushed to hospital. The two men were suffering from severe leg injuries after being hit by shrapnel. Back at the scene, there was a dawning realisation that the very fabric of Melbourne had changed forever. It just, all of a sudden, everything changed. From a bustling city that Melbourne was in that time, it went quiet. It was an unusual quietness all through Melbourne that I'd never really seen before. There were people on the streets, but a lot of people just standing around, couldn't understand what was happening. We couldn't even let people in to put the fire out at that stage because we didn't know what else was there. 
and ended up having a, a man suited up with the appropriate clothing to go, protection to go in there and, and put the fire out. As soon as the fire was under control, police moved in to lock down the scene and ensure there were no further explosive devices. The fact that Australia was at that time unfamiliar with the threat of terrorist bombs made their task all the more challenging. Immediately after the bombing and even the first responders, you know, there was just an absolute feeling of total disbelief that this could happen in Melbourne. You know, before this incident, we'd had minor, uh, minor incidents that might get you a bit concerned, but this was an absolute attack on police and, and society in, in Melbourne. The Victoria Police response was to form a dedicated task force of detectives. Their purpose? To bring those responsible for one of the most heinous acts of terrorism Australia had witnessed to justice. Job one was the crime scene. We virtually uh, closed off a city block and um, we started on the outside and worked our way in um, because of course we needed to reopen the streets. So. A search was done on the buildings surrounding Russell Street and everything that was found within that precinct was labelled, photographed in situ. And uh, it was a very steady, systematic processing of the scene. As detectives began to piece together the vast quantities of forensic evidence at the scene, tragic news reached the task force. Their friend and colleague, Angela Taylor, had lost her fight for life 24 days after the explosion. She was the first female police officer in Australia to be killed in the line of duty. She was compassionate, and um, if she had a skill that she could help someone with, she would yeah. want to use it. Yeah, that, that, yeah. That's, that's pretty well why she wanted to join the police mm. force. Yeah, she wanted to... Yeah, Make a difference. Yeah, she thought she wanted to put something back into the community. Mm. She, you know, mm. she was that, that way inclined. It was a comfort to know that the people that she worked with wanted to do um, what they could. I remember there was, a, there was a young woman that was in her squad that wanted to be outside her room and she volunteered to do that. And that must have been very hard because the whole squad, I'm pretty sure, was close to Angela. I think it's fair to say um, investigating the murder of a colleague is, it has a lot of responsibility. You have to um, maintain a very strict discipline around this is another investigation. But behind it, of course, there is a fact and an indisputable fact that this was an attack on us. In March 1986, the city of Melbourne was reeling from a terrorist attack that targeted police officers. The car bomb that exploded outside police headquarters tragically claimed the life of a female police officer who succumbed to her wounds 24 days later. As the people slowly came to terms with what had happened, police focused their efforts on finding those responsible. As a result of the bombing, just about every criminal haunt in Victoria, if not Australia, was raided. Turned up guns and drugs and whatever. And I think even the, the part of the criminal element thought that this was a no-no. There was even a feeling amongst the criminal fraternity that it was, you know, that this was a step too far. And, um, and of course, the byproduct of that was it brought a lot of attention to the criminal fraternity and there was a probably a tension that they would prefer not, not to have in the circumstances. So um, there was a fair degree of animosity towards the people that were behind the Russell Street bombing. Detectives faced the huge challenge of recovering the thousands of pieces of evidence that were spread over three city blocks. Any single fragment could have represented the vital clue that would lead police to whoever planted the bomb. And we were able to piece together, bit by bit, uh, what was in the vehicle 
at the time it was detonated outside Russell Street. Piecing together that car bit by bit is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. How they found bits of that car a kilometre away and were able to put it in the right spot. Amazing, amazing investigation. And our headquarters was over 50 metres or more away from the blast and yet the roof of the ambulance headquarters had shrapnel spread across it. And I think this piece indicates just the size of the shrapnel that was launched and that distance. The actual gauge of the steel is extremely thick compared to what a modern car would be. And to think what this could have done should there have been more people in Russell Street at the time, I think our injury level could have been much, much higher. The bomb was an offcut of uh, four by two timber where by the alarm going off on the alarm clock completed the electronic circuit between a battery and the electric detonators, which of course caused the bomb to detonate. A crude but effective device. Despite the fact the scene was littered with forensic evidence, police were still unable to pinpoint any individuals who may have been responsible for planting the bomb. That was to change, however, when the Russell Street Task Force were made aware of a bank robbery that took place just hours after the bombing. Four o'clock on the afternoon of the bombing, there was a armed robbery committed on the National Australia Bank at Donvale. Uh, the getaway vehicle was a silver Holden Brock Special. That silver Brock Special was located in the Yarra River at Wonga Park, a northern suburb of Melbourne, uh, some days after the Russell Street bombing. This vehicle was put on the back of a flat top trailer and uh, taken to the Coot Road compound. And two detectives from the Solar Motor Vehicle Squad were, were there to meet it. Sitting in the corner of the Coot Road compound was the remnants of the Russell Street bomb car. So Arthur Adams and John Bradbury, two of the detectives from the Stolen Motor Vehicle Squad, they started out of curiosity looking at the, the bomb wreck. And um, they were both surprised to see that the identifying numbers in the chassis had been drilled out, because that to them was an unusual way of removing identifying numbers from a vehicle. The most common way of doing it was to grind them. And the silver block special arrived on the back of the flat top and it was unloaded and they opened up the bonnet and the first thing they noticed was that it had also had its chassis numbers drilled out. They were rather astonished they found two vehicles in the one place on the one day that had been dealt with in an identical fashion. So Arthur Adams, the sergeant, came back to the task force office and um, he made a statement there and then he said, I believe the person who stole the bomb car also sold, stole that Silver Rock Special. Detectives now turned their attention to the theft of the car involved in the bank robbery. Police discovered that the getaway car's number plates had actually been recovered following a car chase some weeks before, involving known criminal Peter Reed. Could he be the link between the bomb car and the getaway vehicle? On the 25th of April, 1986, almost a month after the bombing, police raided three addresses connected to Reed and his brother, Stephen Komiazik. It was Anzac Day, it was the 25th of April. Um, a series of raids were conducted simultaneously at uh, Reed's address um, in Callista, at uh, 15 Harros Avenue, Nutter Wadding, and at Stephen Komiazik's address in Olive Grove, Baronia. As the detectives approached the properties, they were tragically unaware of what lay ahead. The armed robbery squad members who went to uh, Peter Reed's address were met with gunfire. He's standing up on the bed, uh, shooting it out. Mark Wiley got shot in the stomach, who was lucky to survive. Mark was one of the first people through the door um, at the Callista address. And as Mark approached uh, Peter Reed's bedroom, um, Reed uh, st stood up and uh, fired at him with a, with a revolver. And a number of shots come through the wall and the door. And two of them, from memory, struck Mark. 
and uh, he went down in a critical condition. Uh, Steve Quincy uh, was a detective sergeant at the stolen motor vehicle squad at the time. He courageously went into the line of fire and he returned fire and wounded Peter Reid. Of course, at that stage, we had a very seriously injured police officer and a very seriously injured offender. Mark Wiley and Peter Reid were both rushed to hospital for life-saving surgery. Meanwhile, back at the property, a thorough search was underway. In a canvas army-style bag, we found jelly night and detonators. There were some firearms found at the address which interestingly had the identifying numbers drilled out of them in an identical way to the motor vehicle. We also found a copy of a newspaper wrapped around some jelly night and a petty criminal named Rodney Minogue, his fingerprint was on one of the pages. We also found a partial fingerprint on the toilet door that belonged to a, another petty criminal named Craig William John Minogue. We were then very interested in speaking to the Minogue brothers and um, despite our best efforts, we were just unable to locate them. Unfortunately for the police, Craig Minogue and his brother Rodney had disappeared. As the search for them got underway, attention turned to an individual who was staying at the Harros Avenue address named Carl Zelinka. He had no previous criminal history, but detectives were sure he knew more than he was telling them. We actually spoke to, to Carl and uh, spoke to him about his knowledge of the Minogues and he denied knowing them and um, denied knowing Peter Reid. And um, we knew that wasn't right because we'd spoken to his neighbours and we'd shown neighbours photographs of, uh, of the Minogues and Peter Reid and neighbours had identified them as being people that frequented 15 Harris Avenue in Nutter Wadding. So, Carl was lying through his teeth to us, uh, but we couldn't quite work out what the motivation for it all was at that stage. From the examination of the crime scene, the forensic were able to put together what, how the bomb had been set up. And it had been put on a block of wood with a, an alarm clock. As a result of going to Harris Avenue and Nutter Whiting, we found that uh, the block of wood matched a fence post at Harris Avenue. Some slivers of timber which fitted perfectly across a fault line in the bomb block and also still attached to the fencing. So we knew in our own mind then scientifically that the bomb block of wood had come from the fence line at 15 Harris Avenue, Nutter Wadding. And we then formed a fairly strong view that Carl Zelenka knew a lot more about uh, the Minogues and Peter Reid than he was telling us. Faced with increasingly incriminating evidence against him, Zelinka began to talk, and one of the crucial pieces of information he provided was the name of another man who he thought could be involved. They used to refer to him as Stan the Man, and um, I had a very diligent detective on my crew named Mark Harris, and I said to Mark, go to the record section and find Stan the Man. And he found a male person in his early 50s, Stanley Brian Taylor. whose driver's licence was registered to the Minogue's parents' address. That then formed the identification of Stan the Man. Yeah, he'd been involved on the wrong side of the law for most of his life from the age of 12, I think. And he'd done a lot of uh, hold-ups and other crimes. He was a serious armed robber, really not the type of fellow you'd expect to be hanging out with a couple of young fellows like the Minogues. But what had happened was is that when Stan was released from prison, he'd become a social worker. And um, he was employed um, out in the Murrelbark area uh, to work with youth, supposedly to keep them out of trouble and to not make the mistakes in life that he'd made. He was fairly charismatic. He'd been to jail, he'd robbed banks, he'd come out, he'd, he used to get acting bit parts in, in uh, Australian drama series. So he had some sort of a lure for these young men and he groomed them. 
in the guise of helping them on the straight and narrow, he was in fact grooming them to be young attack dogs and he turned them into very effective armed robbers. This afternoon, a man was flown to Swan Hill by the police air wing. The Birchett man has also agreed to a further interview period by police over the Russell Street bombing. He knew his way around the system very well, but he also knew that in the first in was best dressed when it came to doing deals. Taylor immediately uh, nominated uh, the Minogues and Peter Reid as the Russell Street bombers. Not so quick to implicate himself. Staley, Brian Taylor eventually gave us a phone number for the boys, which turned into be the uh, Lady Jane Motel uh, at Swan Hill. They raided the motel room and the two boys uh, were in bed and the loaded sawn-off shotgun was laying on the floor between them. As they were arrested and being led out of the room, uh, Craig Minogue said to Rodney, remember the rules, Rodney. And that's all he said from that stage on. He wouldn't be interviewed, he wouldn't talk at all. But they were all subsequently charged with the bombing. With the chief suspects in custody, detectives focused their attentions on the next challenge, to assemble a case that would convince a jury that they had caught the right men. In 1988, the trial began of the men charged with committing one of the most heinous acts of terrorism in Australian history. A huge car bomb had claimed the life of 21-year-old police officer Angela Taylor and sent shockwaves through the city. As the court date approached, the meticulous and diligent police investigation into who had planted the bomb was about to be revealed. The volume of physical evidence was staggering, really. And, and how, how we could tie each person into it. But all that had to come into the court. So it's, it was good evidence. Another major source of evidence came from an associate of Craig Minogue, Taylor and Reed, called Paul Hetzel. He had a history of violent crime and robbery, and when arrested in June 1986, he agreed to tell what he knew about the plot. He described the alleged bombers as having a hatred of police and a desire to kill as many officers as possible. Now, Hetzel was an interesting character. He knew straight away who was involved in the Russell Street bombing and he'd been privy to conversations in the lead up to it. And um, we located him a couple of days after the arrest of Stan Taylor and uh, Gary Ayres and I interviewed Paul Hetzel over the course of a, a day or two and he told us the whole history, filled in a few missing spots that, uh, that we were unaware of, of course, and that uh, Carl Zelenka wasn't aware of. So Hetzel virtually um, filled in all the missing pieces that we hadn't at that stage. The trial of the alleged bombers began in January 1988. Peter Reed, Craig and Rodney Minogue and Stan Taylor faced a number of charges, including murder and conspiring to blow up the Russell Street Police headquarters. In proceedings before the trial started, the charges against Stephen Komiazik were dropped due to insufficient evidence. The, uh, the offenders were uh, faced a committal proceeding at the Melbourne Magistrates Court and in fact I was the first witness and I gave my evidence of my observations and as I walked out of the court uh, Craig Minogue spat on me and I just looked at him and walked out. Well it was one of the longest criminal trials in Victoria's history. Trial raged for months. Um, witnesses were in, uh, in the witness box for days on end. Um, the integrity of people was attacked by defence counsel as, you, as is normal in a high profile criminal trial. Um, I will say this, uh, Hetzel and Zelenka gave evidence that in my mind was 100% truthful. Um, we corroborated virtually everything that those two men told us. Unfortunately, um, it's difficult when you have a criminal uh, giving evidence in a criminal trial against his colleagues. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that the jury um, were quite happy with Carl Zelenka because he did not have a criminal history. I'm not sure they were as convinced as to uh, Paul Hetzel's integrity.
In August 1988, and after a trial that lasted almost eight months, featuring 156 witnesses, at last the jury returned its verdict. Stan Taylor was convicted. Um, he was sentenced to life imprisonment, never to be released. Um, Craig Minogue was convicted. Um, he was sentenced to 40 years with a 27-year minimum. Uh, young Rodney Minogue was convicted and sentenced to accessory after the fact of the Russell Street bombing. Um, Peter Reid was acquitted. However, he was convicted by the jury of using a firearm to prevent apprehension and attempted murder of Detective Sergeant Steve Quincy, who was the police officer who actually shot him. Peter Reid's acquittal was a bitter pill. The, um, the jury were, look, they were locked up for months in a very difficult criminal trial. You can never be critical of juries. They do um, their very best in very difficult circumstances. Um, and I think really when you look at um, the evidence they listened to, they gave a, a verdict that was in their mind was, uh, was the correct and just one to give. So. Um, you know, that's life. Handing down one of the toughest sentences since the abolition of the death penalty in Australia, the judge likened the actions of Craig Minogue and Stan Taylor to an act of war. Rodney Minogue's conviction was later overturned on appeal. His brother Craig is eligible for parole from 2016. Craig Minogue, he, uh, he's made something of himself whilst he's in custody. He's uh, a PhD or a doctorate of some sort. Um, so, you know, it's going to be up to someone like the parole board to be able to make that decision and say, well, is he a fit person to be put back into the community? Has he been rehabilitated? Look, Craig Minogue is a very dangerous individual um, who demonstrated he was capable of extreme violence. I'll always be very concerned that the real Craig Minogue um, might one day um, do something else if he is released. Stan Taylor, of course, will never be released. Uh, Stan's a dreadful human being. His life has just been one catastrophic waste. He's damaged a lot of people along the way. My understanding is he really has a visitor in prison and he's going to die in prison a lonely old man, and which is really what he deserves. Southern 507, we have people with injuries. We require an ambulance, please. It was a statement of war, and all I can say is those who were involved in it, all I can say, they are the biggest fucking cowards you can ever, ever imagine. How dare they? With a, with a car full of explosives, park out in front of a, a, a police station, have no regard to anyone coming in and out of courts, walking up and down streets, and are prepared to blow everyone up. I'd look them in the eye and tell him, you're just fucking cowards. I don't believe any of these people should ever be released back into society. If someone's got a propensity to do what they did, that propensity will still be there. And if they do get out, it's my firm belief that they won't last very long. With the perpetrators locked up for their offences, the city of Melbourne tried to move on. That is until 1992, when the disappearance of a young teenage girl, six years after the explosion, would bring the Russell Street bomb back to the headlines. With the Russell Street bombers behind bars after a trial that lasted eight months, Melbourne began to move on. Until the abduction of a girl made headlines and rumours began to circulate that it was connected to the bombing. Prue Bird was the teenage daughter of a woman called Jenny Bird and Prue Bird disappeared in 1992, one sunny Sunday afternoon. She vanished from the face of the earth. Her mother suspects 
from very early days that it's a very sinister disappearance connected with her mother's connection with this major criminal. Prue's grandmother, Julie, had started a relationship with a man closely associated with the Russell Street bombing. His name was Paul Hetzel, the star witness in the trial of the bombers back in 1988. She met Paul when she used to visit jail. When he gets out of jail, he manipulates her to purchase weapons, to have driver's licenses and to rent uh, properties, houses and things. All he brings to the relationship is a um, briefcase with a pistol in it. He's a very bad man. He knows other very bad men. Among them, a group of people led by a man called Stan Taylor and including two brothers, Rodney and Craig Minogue, and a, another man called Peter Reid. As these four men were standing trial, charged with numerous offences relating to the Russell Street bombing, disturbing rumours began to surface. During the court case, Prue's grandmother gives evidence that one of the bombers, Craig Minogue, had once threatened her, and he had said to her, if you ever talk about us, or dob us into the police or inform what will happen to your one of your grandkids, like little dear little Prue. Allegedly, Minogue made that threat to the Hetzels when Prue Bird was there at seven years of age asleep in the other room. Now, Craig Minogue denies that, but I believe the Hetzel. Craig Minogue has consistently denied making any such threat to Julian Paul Hetzel about their granddaughter, Prue, and any involvement in her disappearance. Her body has never been found. In 2009, new information came to light that seemingly pointed police in a new direction. 17 years later, in jail in Victoria, a very bad man called Leslie Camilleri starts talking about being connected with not only the murders he's been convicted of, which were horrific murders, he starts to tell people that he was involved in the Prue Bird case. The police get to hear about this. They go and see him and they said, look, we just want to clear this up. Can you help? Leslie Camilleri is a monster, but he's a monster who doesn't want to get himself killed in jail. And he realises if he gives um, a, very, a very clear story that there's a fair chance that he will be killed in jail. So what he does is he, he goes to court and he gives a sort of a lame half version of the truth. And he said that he had abducted Prue, but he wouldn't supply all the links and he wouldn't identify where the body was. Leslie Camilleri was found guilty and in 2013 sentenced to 28 years for admitting the murder of Prue Bird. He refused to give any details about the circumstances of her death and the location of her body. Despite his claims he acted alone, some remain convinced there was another person involved. For others, the links between Prue's disappearance and the Russell Street bomb refused to fade away. I believe the threat was made, and I don't think Cavalier is telling everything that he knows. He certainly admitted killing the girl, but he's, there's a lot more behind it. There's more to it. And I, I think even any, any investigator will say the same, but if, unless you get the information, you can't take it any further. I'm certain in my own mind um, that Prue Bird was murdered as a consequence of Julian Paul Hetzel's evidence they gave at the trial. The Russell Street bomb was one of the first major terrorist attacks the state of Victoria had witnessed. It is nothing short of miraculous that the explosion claimed only a single life. Both Ian West and Constable Carl Donadio, who were severely wounded by shrapnel from the bomb, recovered from their injuries. The mental scars for them and the city as a whole, however, were not so quick to heal. It seemed to me that criminals in Victoria had reached that moral level where um, they just didn't care what they did. And I think Russell Street was the start of that. The Russell Street bombing was a turning point in the history of Melbourne. It is still talked about, and it's amazing how many people when it comes up or the anniversaries come up, 
Everyone remembers where they were and what they were doing at that particular time. Probably won't leave me. But we'll do the best we can. But I just, I just so feel so sorry for the Taylor family. As I said, they haven't had the benefit of seeing her marry, uh, having grandkids. Yeah, no, it's awful. Angela's left a lot behind to remind um, everybody of the work that she did and um, the love that she had for a job. One of the lovely, um, tangible things is Angela's rose, and that's beautiful. And that's around um, some police stations, and uh, oh, it's it's everywhere, isn't it, mm -hmm. Arthur? And mm -hmm. so we have the Blue Ribbon Foundation and with all the fun runs and activities where money is raised. It goes to giving equipment to hospitals so that the life continues on even though we haven't got Angela in her way, she's still working to um, save other lives. Almost 30 years after the explosion, the Russell Street bomb claimed another victim, Mark Wiley. The detective shot during the raid on Peter Reed's address tragically took his own life in 2014. Yeah, Mark Wiley was a colleague of mine in the Victoria Police and a thorough gentleman and one of the best investigators I ever worked with. And he's a perfect example of the effects of trauma can have on you years later. Now, we all knew Mark was in a bit of trouble mentally for the last 12 months of his life. Uh, a lot of people tried to assist him, but unfortunately it didn't work. I don't think Mark ever recovered. He had demons um, after, the, after being shot and the, and the dreadful consequences of that. One of the tragedies of it all, that people don't know what's going on in other people's heads or their minds or their hearts, and um, often they don't seek the help they clearly need. Well, tragically, they, it's only clear that they need it after the event and after it's too late. Constantly dealing with traumatic incidents and constantly being in a situation where there's a degree of physical risk, there's no doubt in my mind that, um, that we all pay a price for that. I think we really need to do a lot more work around um, looking after some of those people than we probably do at the moment. Um, and I think Victoria Police as an organisation, we're really starting to closely look at this now and, um, and starting to put things in place where we, where we deal with this. Um, see, of course, the difficulty is, is when these people leave our organisation, they get lost. And, um, and um, you know, I think Mark was a, was an example of that.